guys. Sorry about that. I'm glad I went back up here. I had a patient who was getting a massage and still needed an adjustment. I wouldn't I didn't know she was still here, so I got that taken care of. <laughs> um, okay, so whenever I go to a seminar or any kind of a workshop or something, I will when they start with a joke. Okay, so I'm going to start with a joke. <laughs> yeah. um, I am very, very bad at telling jokes, um, but I'm pretty good at getting jokes. Um, I went to this seminar this one time, and they told this joke, and I, for the life of me, could not get it. So I'm going to tell you guys, if y'all can explain this to me, that would be awesome. Okay, <laughs> okay so uh, there's this guy. He, he's an he's an, uh, engineer, so he's very, very you know mathematically minded. He calculates everything out, and he decides he wants to build a barbecue pit in his backyard. So he knows exactly where he wants to put it. He knows exactly what it wants to look like. So he draws it out, calculates everything out. He needs, you know, the grill, he needs the top, he needs all this stuff. He needs 249 bricks to make this grow. So he goes to Home Depot, he goes to get this, this, this supplies. And uh, he walks in and he finds an associate and he says, okay, I need to get this, 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 and this. And I said, and he says, I need to get 249 bricks. She says, okay, I can get you this, 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 and this, but the bricks come in pallets, so it would be 250. And he goes, well, I don't need 250, I need 249. And she's like, well, sorry, I can't sell you 249 single bricks, I can sell you a pallet. So he's like, fine, whatever. He's kind of mad, but he's like, I don't want to pay for this extra break, but you know, whatever. So he buys it, takes it home, builds this beautiful barbecue pit. It's exactly what he imagined. And he's sitting there, and he's looking at it, and he's just all proud and everything. And he looks over and he sees that brick on the, on the pallet, and he starts getting mad. He's like, I knew I didn't have to pay for that. I knew I was wasting my money. I told them I didn't need it. Goes over, picks the brick up, looks at it, face turns red, gets his mad again, and just it rears back and throws the brick as hard as he can up in the air, and the brick never comes down. <laughs> did you get it? Explain it because I did not get that. <laughs> and everybody started laughing at the workshop or the seminar that I was at, and I was like, I do not understand this. So, so if you got it, share it with me afterwards so I can like get the humor on this. <laughs> you don't get it? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So my name is Dr. Price. Um, I'm a chiropractic physician. Uh, one of the first things that I get uh, when I'm doing these workshops, especially on thyroid, is why is a chiropractor talking to people about thyroid and hormones and, and all the things that we do. So I'm going to go a little bit into that with you guys, but before we do, let's do a little housekeeping. I usually do this on PowerPoint so you guys can see what I'm looking at, but I'm going to take this whole board tonight, so I'm going to keep the PowerPoint off so I can write everything up here. Um, that's my email address. If you would, while we're doing the workshop, if you would hold any questions, because if we start answering questions, we'll be here all night, because I'll start talking and we'll, we'll never go home. Um, but if you do have any questions that I don't get to by the end of the workshop, if we don't have time to answer them, then um, you can email me this. Just, if you would, in the subject line, put workshop question, so it gets my attention. Okay? Um, let's go ahead and silence our cell phones, just in case we get a call or anything. I'm always the one that's guilty of that. <laughs> I was doing a workshop one time, and I got three phone calls, and all three of them were from three different employees who knew I was doing the workshop, and they're all calling me. I'm like, I'll do it. <laughs> they were here. I don't understand. Um, okay, so got that questions, got the email address. Okay, so I, I, I like to tell my story because when I tell my story, it kind of tells you guys how I got to where I'm doing what I'm doing. You've known me a long time. I used to not do thyroid work back when you first came out. Um, so when I was 19, I was playing football in college. Okay, that sounds all great. I was playing football with friends in college. I was not on a football team, not that athletic. <laughs> um, but I bent down to catch the ball and I threw my back out. I uh, came home to visit my parents that weekend. They took me to a chiropractor, a local guy, and he adjusted me and I felt better. Um, got a series of a couple of adjustments um, over the next three or four years. And um, I met a girl when I was 18 and she was 18. And uh, we started dating and when she was 18, she started having real bad back pain. Didn't know anything about it. You know, I was in college for, um, for sports medicine, but I didn't know anything about the back at that point. Uh, she had her first back surgery at 18. Came out of the surgery, it was, not a, it was a laminectomy, so she had a good chance of recovery. Uh, came out of the back surgery, I'm like, okay, let's do our therapy, let's do what we gotta do. She didn't want anything to do with it. She just kind of went back to what she was doing. Had her second back surgery, I think about 21. Same thing, just came out of surgery at this time point. She had a foot drop, she, which is where she could hold her foot up. It kept kind of flopping on the floor. Um, numbness in the left leg, we used losing sensation there. Um, so I was watching this happen. And when I was 24, I was sitting on the couch playing tug of war with a chihuahua, yeah, chihuahua, <laughs> and bent over and I blew a disc in my back. 
and um, tried everything I could think of for eight months to avoid surgery. Chiropractic, we didn't have decompression back then, we didn't have all these technologies that we have now, but so I had surgery at 24. Um, and that's what put me on the path to become a chiropractor because when I got out, I became adamant about getting my adjustments. I already had the sports science background, so I just kind of went forward with that. Well, she had her third back surgery a couple months after I had mine because she had continued to, to uh, regress. So we ended up parting ways, we broke up and everything. Well, I got a call about three years later and uh, she was in the hospital. She was uh, in an ICU in liver failure mm. and she ended up passing away at 27. Aww. Because she had gone down that path, taken the medications and so on and so forth. I am not anti-medication. Um, there's a time and a place for it. Um, but she didn't need that. She just didn't do what she had to do. So I watched her go down that spiral and ended up dying at a very young age. Mm. Uh, so when I went to chiropractic school, part of my mission was keep people out of back surgery. Because there is no pain worse than the pain that I felt when I woke up from that surgery. I was miserable. Overall, I've done great with it. You know, I've done what I was supposed to do and I've done well. But, um, but man, when I woke up, I swear to God, I would never do that again. <laughs> and I haven't, so. Um, so that's what I went to chiropractic school for. So I'm in chiropractic school and I start learning, you know, have, holy cow, we can actually heal the body. I thought chiropractic was just for, you know, neck pain and back pain, like we all, you know, are kind of programmed to think it is. Uh, well, we started learning how the body can heal. And the way the body, the, the philosophy of chiropractic, and this is not a chiropractic seminar, but the philosophy of chiropractic is the brain controls everything in the body. And as long as the signal can get from the brain to the tissue without interference, then the body can heal itself. And when I was in chiropractic school, man, we saw, we learned stories of miraculous healing, people with cancer, people with low thyroid, all these different things would go in, they'd get a few adjustments and they would heal because the body could work. So I came out of school, I was pumped, I was ready to go. And I started seeing patients and did a lot of neck pain, back pain work, you know, got decompression to make sure to keep people out of surgery, uh, so on and so forth. And we had some of those miracles. We had people that would come in, I'd adjust them and they'd lose 10 pounds because their thyroid would start functioning or they would gain gastric function back, or they would have kids, which was sometimes not a good thing. <laughs> but they would become fertile, and they would get pregnant. And so all these little miracles did happen, but it didn't happen on the grand scale that I thought, or that I had learned in chiropractic school. So I was listening to a lecturer talk one day, and he said, the difference between chiropractic now and chiropractic 50 years ago is the food supply. Because we had started processed foods, we had started right. the standard American diet. So. I became very, very intrigued, and I was always very intrigued and interested in nutrition, but I didn't know how to practice it. I was just doing what I was trained in school and so on. Um, about five years ago now, maybe four or five years ago, my uh, oldest daughter started putting on weight. I've got four kids, and all four of my kids are pretty slender. Well, she started putting on weight. Couldn't figure out what it was. You know, just we, we tried diet, we tried this, we tried that, couldn't figure out what it was, so we ran labs on her. And uh, she came back with Hashimoto's. Okay, you guys are familiar with that? That's okay. Right, yeah. okay. Um, so she came back Hashimoto's and a really high level of antibodies. So I started freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to put my daughter on medication. She's 11 years old. There's no way we're doing this for the rest of her life. I got to figure out what to do. So I started studying functional nutrition and functional medicine. And basically what that is, is you run a set of labs, you analyze them in the way that I'm going to show you all tonight. Then you apply a nutritional protocol with supplementation, and then you rerun the labs to make sure you're getting the results you want. If you are, you keep doing it. If you're not, you change. So that's what I did with her. And she's doing phenomenal well. She's 16, going into collegiate. She's 5'7". She was like 115. She's just, just doing phenomenally well. Okay, so Hashimoto's can't be handled. Um, so then I come into practice. I'm doing my thing here and everything. And I start noticing almost it seems like every patient's on Synthroid or Levo or yeah. you know Armor or something. So I start working with patients on it. And I'm getting good results with people, but I'm not working with 11 and 12 year olds now, I'm working with people in their 50s and their 60s, so they have brain issues that are coming along with this. Okay, and I guess you guys have noticed if you have a thyroid yeah. condition long enough, you start having brain issues. So I had to start studying functional neurology, which is phenomenal, I love functional neurology. Um, and what that is, is using the theory of neuroplasticity to actually help the brain recover its functions. So that's kind of how I've morphed. I came in as a chiropractor, treating back pain and neck pain, started functional nutrition to work with my daughter, and then just morphed into functional neurology. So that's how our practice has become what it's become. Okay, so I just want to kind of give you all that, that background, basically, so you can understand why I'm going to be talking to you guys about this. Okay, um, 
also a certified postural exercise professional because I'm a chiropractor, that's what we do. <laughs> so just a part of the deal. Um, I've been in practice for uh, 11 years now, going on 12 years uh, here in this location. I've actually been practicing about 13 years, but I practiced up in Kentucky for a couple of years. Um, and just the practice just keeps on changing. And, and I love every minute of it. And I love doing this kind of work because it's just watching people unfold is just phenomenal. Um, one of the things I want to do is that little half sheet of paper that you guys have. If you fill that out with all your information, when you leave tonight, leave that with Anna at the front desk, and I'm going to send you guys out our DVD. Um, it goes into a little more detail about what we're talking about tonight. It's a thyroid DVD that we shot. So, okay. And then also, um, our goal for tonight is to go through these questionnaires and help you guys understand what your web of physiological dysfunction is. Okay, you'll understand what that means as you go through this, but that's, that's what our intention is for tonight. Okay? All right. <clears throat> First thing we have to do is we have to get away from labels. Okay, you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Um, you may have been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. You may have been diagnosed with either one. All three of you probably have completely different causes to what's going on, okay? And that's the important thing that we have to understand. When we get a label put on us, especially in the medical paradigm, then that's where the focus goes. It's you treat that symptom, you treat that lab value, and that's all you focus on. You don't focus on the whole system. Um, so we've got to get away from labels. Uh, we need to know them. It's good to know so we have a measuring point or at least an identity of what's going on, but we don't treat based on the labels. I think you guys have heard the saying, what is it? Uh, we treat the person with the disease, not the disease that has the person or something like that. But it's more important yeah. that you focus on the person <laughs> and what's going on with them. All right. Um, let's see. And my other goal is, uh, as we go through this process, uh, patients who work with us in our office are with us for anywhere from six weeks up to about six months. My goal for each and every patient when we're doing nutritional work with them is that we give them an exit strategy. When I have a patient that walks in the door, especially if it's an elderly patient, and they go up front to schedule their next appointment, and they pull out their little planner, and they, they're like, well, I can't come out on this day, I've got this doctor's appointment, and it's, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's my daughter, I can't get mad about that. Uh -huh. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I still can't figure out how to work these thing phones. Okay, I think that. Um, if you okay. hold it in, it'll shut off. Yeah, wait, <laughs> then I'm in trouble with life calls. She's like, where are you? Like, she's gotta be able to get me on Life 360. <laughs> um, so, but we wanna, you know, have patients up there and they're trying to schedule and, and they're trying to find places in their schedule, but they have to juggle between all their different doctor's appointments. And we're not designed to be like that. You aren't designed to be spending your days at the doctor's office. You're not even here. I'm you know? tired of the doctors. Yeah, it, 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 it overtakes you. It overtakes your schedule. So my goal is to give everybody an exit strategy where you understand what you need to be doing for your body and your body specifically, how you need to do it, what you need to be eating, what supplements to be taking, what exercises to be doing, and then kind of let me go and do it. And then that's what our goal is. So that you kind of get your life back and get your responsibility back. So. Um, now, there are a couple things that we have to understand when we're going through this process. Uh, we're always looking for a quick fix. There's a, a saying that says the elevator to uh, excellent health is closed, okay? And mm -hmm. the fact is it never, uh, it never existed. Um, basically, we look for that quick fix. You know, you lose 30 pounds in 30 days, or um, Dr. Oz, man, he knows all these quick fixes. I learn a new one each week when I'm in the grocery store. It's just amazing. Um, but it's a step-by-step -step process. And it's not just step by step, but it's step by step on an individual basis. And I'll give you guys an example. There was a guy sitting, luckily that chair's empty because that's the one I always pick on. There was a guy sitting in that chair at one workshop. And I'm going through all the information, and he stands up and he says, okay guys, he goes, look, this is all really good information, but I'm gonna tell you what you have to do. He said, stop eating at five o'clock. I started doing it six weeks ago. I've lost 30 pounds. I sleep like a baby. I'm doing great. Everything is wonderful. That's all you have to do. Okay, all right, okay. Thank you for your words, I appreciate it. In that workshop, there was a lady sitting right there, a lady sitting there, a lady sitting here that came in for treatment with us, and all three of those ladies were hypoglycemic. What's the worst thing that you can do? Yes, <laughs> I am too. Yeah, so you, you stop eating at five o'clock, you're gonna be hypoglycemic all through the night as you fast until you get to breakfast the next morning, and there's no way your body's gonna heal. So it worked for him, it could work for me, because I'm not, I don't have sugar handling issues, but for somebody who has sugar handling issues, that's the worst thing that you can do. And so the point on that is his advice is good for him, but for other people it could actually be dangerous. Right. So, yeah. so you've got to make the right steps. And then the other thing you have to do is you have to have congruent behavior. So once you figure out what the right step for you is, and you know what your goal is, 
As long as you take those small congruent steps every day, the outcome is inevitable. If you take the wrong steps, you'll always get the results that, congruent, that are congruent with the activities that you do. So if you choose the wrong diet or you choose the wrong foods or things like that, you're gonna get the outcome that puts you down that pathway versus taking the right choices, okay? Now there is some genetic factors and some things like that that are involved in that, but as a general rule, you take the, follow, you take the right steps, you're gonna get the right outcome, okay? All right, so I've got a list on here and this is the one run side that I regret that I can't show you guys. Um, it's a list of all the symptoms that uh, patients that suffer from uh, hypo hypothyroidism typically will have. So I'm going to go through a list here, and there's a purpose of why I'm doing this. So we've got fatigue, weight gain, um, headaches, constipation, stomach aches, and bloating, and gas. Okay, now that's all can be clumped, uh, clumped into the digestive system. Okay, then we've got uh, headaches, depression, brain fog. Um, we've got short-term memory loss, you know, what, what do they call it, the uh, thyroid brain, some people yeah. like to call it. Yeah. Um, basically, that's a neurological issue, okay? Then we've got getting sick easily, can't, can't recover from illness very well. Um, wounds can take a little bit of slower time healing. Okay, that's an immune system issue. And then we have muscle cramping, cold intolerance, um, uh, muscle fatigue, muscle weakness, that's a muscular system issue. Okay, all of these are different systems in the body that are affected by low thyroid function. Right? The thyroid is just one aspect. How does it affect all these systems? Well, the reason it does is because the thyroid gland controls all the metabolic function, but every cell in the body has thyroid receptors on it. Okay, so if that thyroid function is not happening, all the cells in the body are affected, and therefore their systems are affected, uh, especially the brain. The thyroid loves to affect the brain. Okay, so that's one of the important things that we need to understand as we go through this process. All right, so I'm going to draw my favorite part of this, the thyroid metabolic pathway. Yeah. Are you excited? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Now that's the part of the brain that's kind of our regulatory center, okay? So it's our sleep wake cycle, it, it manages our hormone function, our appetite, so on and so forth. If the hypothalamus picks up that there is not enough T4 in the blood, then the hypothalamus will say, okay, we need to increase our metabolic activity. So it's gonna send a signal to the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland is gonna increase thyroid stimulating hormone, which is TSH, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, and that's gonna tell the thyroid gland to release T4 and T3, okay? So if you've ever been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, they probably ran this test right here and it was probably elevated and they said, okay, you have hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. okay? Now, does this make sense as to why that TSH being high would mean that you have low thyroid function? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So the thyroid gland, now this is not a thyroid hormone, it's a pituitary hormone, okay? We haven't even gotten to the thyroid at that point. Now the thyroid gland releases T4 and T3. 93% of what the thyroid makes is T4, 7% is T3. T3 is the active form of the thyroid hormone. So I like to use coffee grounds as this example. So T3 would be, you get a coffee filter, you put your, your ground up coffee beans in there, and you put it in the coffee maker, you run the hot water through it, you get a nice cup of coffee, okay? T4 would be, you take coffee beans, put them in the filter, put it in there, run the hot water through it. You, you might get a little bit of brownness in your water, but it's not gonna be a cup of coffee. I had some at a church there and I was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this has to be processed, okay? This T3, can go on out and assuming you don't have any nutrient deficiencies that get into the cells and be used, okay? So T4 has to go onto thyroid binding globulin. So that's kind of like a taxi cab. T4 gets on that thyroid binding globulin, it goes to the liver, to the gut, to the kidneys, and then to all the other tissues in the body for that conversion of T4 to T3, okay? So the important part of this is if you've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and you've been put on Synthroid or Levothyroxine or one of those hormones, that's synthetic T4, okay? So you get that T4, it goes back, it tells the hypothalamus, hey, we have enough T4, so your TSH will actually start to normalize. And in most patients that I see that are hypothyroid, their TSH is actually low because they're on that medication to get that number way down. You got your T4 here, 
So everything should be working great because you have your, your lab values are normal, but you guys still feel horrible. Okay. The reason for that is your T4 is either not getting onto that thyroid binding globulin, or if it is, it's getting out here and something's breaking down here. Okay. This is only the beginning of a pathway. And that's where when you just run TSH, that's where the, the, the medical aspect of it stops. Okay? That's why patients still feel so poorly with that. So that's the basic understanding here. Okay. Make sense? The go map? Hey, the other thing, when you take a lab value, they basically take all the labs that they collected over patients over a certain period of time and they establish what normal is. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Who who goes and gets labs done? Healthy people or sick people? Sick people. Sick Now I go get labs done just because I'm curious not to play around with my numbers, but um, <laughs> I, I consider myself a healthy person, but for the most part it's sick people. So they make this average based on a sick population, okay? And then they'll establish what a normal is. And, and right now, I think it's like 0.4 to 4.0 for TSH to be considered normal. Right. Okay, Actually, it's like 4.5, I think. It depends on the lab. They all have different variations. So if you go and you get your labs done, and you're sitting right here at, let's say, 4.1, well, you're within normal ranges, so they're going to tell you your lab values are normal. Okay? In functional medicine, we're not looking at normal. We're looking at optimal. Okay, and we've done this for every lab value that there is out there, or at least the majority of it, we have what the optimal levels are. So for TSH, we want to see 1.8 to 3.0. So I'm going to take that same lab that you guys took that they're telling you is normal, and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, okay, this is low thyroid function. It's not hypothyroidism, you're not diagnosable, but we don't want to diagnose you, we want to try to heal it before it becomes that, goes that far. So we're going to see that you have decreased thyroid function, and we're going to start working with it at that point. Okay. And we're, like I said, we're going to do that with every lab value, blood sugar, uh, your kidney uh, markers, your liver markers, all these different markers. Okay? So that's how we can uncover where you're having these loss of function before it comes into a lab value and into a disease process. Okay? All right. So that aspect. Now, I've got a great example of this. When I first started doing this kind of work, I had a lady walk in, and uh, she was actually referred in from a patient. And I was sitting back in that back room with her. And she's like, Dr. Price. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to show the next up here. <laughs> okay. she, she was a really, really sweet, sweet lady. And she's like, I just don't understand it. She said, I used to be so social. You know, I was very involved with my church. I was very, very, you know, I love my friends. I was very passionate, she said. And for the last several months, I can't stand to go out of the house. I'm just anxious all the time. I just can't do it. That's me. That's you? Okay. Um, and so in her history, we talked about it. And she had had an exploratory surgery done on her, her female parts. And she was like, since I woke up from that surgery, I've been anxious and cannot get it shaken. So I'm talking to her and everything. I'm like, okay, well, let's run your labs. So we ran her labs, and her labs come back. And she was probably, I'm going to say she was like 0.5 on her uh, on her TSH. Now, I had just started this work. Okay, I didn't know what to do. 0.5 is hyperthyroid. Okay, it's not diagnosable, but it's moving towards hyperthyroid. So I told her, I said, look. Hyperthyroid can be dangerous. Heart palpitations, heart attack, all these different things can happen with hyperthyroidism. So when I saw that number, I said, we've got to do something about this before it becomes an issue. And I referred her off to an endocrinologist because I didn't know what to do. She goes back, goes sees him, come back in about a week later, and she said, well, he said it was all in my mind and put me on uh, antidepressant and said I was fine. Yep. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Nothing, nothing I can do at that point. I didn't know how to treat hyperthyroid, so I was going to try to do it because I didn't want to mess around it and hurt her. So I said, okay, well, let's follow up in a few months and see how we're doing and see if it's working for you. So she leaves, she comes back in a few months later, ran her labs again. She was at 0 .001. She was real bad. Wow. Husband had to bring her in, be here with her. She couldn't function, just, just horrible. I said, okay, so antidepressants aren't working for you, are they? <laughs> so she, I referred her out to a different endocrinologist. And if I saw that number now for somebody that was not on medication, I would refer them out. You know, that's something you got to get handled first. So, sent her out to a different endocrinologist. What he discovered was that the, the dye that they had used for that female procedure had iodine in it, and she was allergic to the iodine. Yikes. So it had slammed her into hyperthyroid, a severe case of hyperthyroid. So he was able to do a technique that I don't like, where they had to slow thyroid function, basically kind of poison the thyroid gland. They had to get her calmed down because she was just going crazy. And then once they did that, then we can go in and do what we could do with her. Um, but my question is, wouldn't it have been so much easier to fix right there mm -hmm. if they had just used that functional lab value instead of letting it progress the way that it did? 
like that. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's an example of how that works. Okay. And again, we use that for every lab value when we're when we're analyzing this stuff. Okay. All right. So let's see. What's my I'm rambling. I'm following my thing. Okay. All right. So I need y'all to pull out the form that had all the yeses and nos on it. And what I want you to do is I want you to count the number of yeses that you circled, and you're going to be in trouble because you didn't fill yours out. <laughs> I just um, count the number of yeses that you uh, that you circled and write it at the bottom of the page for me. Be easier just to tell you I got three no's and the rest of them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So everybody, let me know when you got your number. Got your number? Okay, so this is a questionnaire that's telling us about brain function. All right, um, we understand that there's normal variation. You're going to have some issues that come up either with aging and so on and so forth. So on this questionnaire, we allow for five yeses to be normal. Anything above above five indicates that there's a brain based issue. Anybody Yikes. have five? I got 36. I, I have 39. So, I'm in 36. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> Did that have any questions on it? <laughs> I got 39. 39. Okay. Okay. So quite quite a few. Okay. So that's indicative of pretty, a pretty significant brain-based issue. Okay. So on your, your clear piece of paper, <clears throat> write a circle. And in that circle, I want you to write what the main motivating factor is that brought you in. Is it weight gain? Is it low energy? Is it depression? You. It, is it me? Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> <Sean>. <laughs> um, My doctor won't send me to an endocrinologist. He just, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. And there, there, there's reasons behind that. We'll kind of get into that as we're, as we're going through this. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, so just whatever you mean. Hey, if it's a bunch of them, there's all those symptoms, just write thyroid. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be the, 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 the basis of our web that we're going to build out. If you had more than five yeses on that questionnaire, then you're going to draw a line up and you're going to write the word brain because that means that there's possibly a brain based issue. Okay. Now, here's a question What system do you guys think uses the most energy in the body? Do you think it's the uh, gastrointestinal tract, which is your digestive system, the musculoskeletal tract, which is your movement, your muscles? The endocrine system, which is all your hormones, or the neurological system, which is your brain and spinal cord. Endocrine. Endocrine. Okay. Neurological. Yeah. Brain. 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 You, you yeah. still are going. Yeah. Brain. <laughs> um, so basically, metabolism is taking food, converting that food into energy. When that food's converted into energy, thirty percent of that food is consumed by the brain. Okay. So when you say it hurts to think and it makes you it wears you out to think, you're not lying, it wears you out. It is a highly metabolic active area. It's about 5% of our body weight, but it consumes 30% of our energy. So when you have bad metabolism, you have bad fuel going to the brain, you have bad brain function. So that's why thyroid affects so much on people with brain function, okay? All right, so what are the things that we look for um, with brain, de brain deficit? So one of them is uh, the frontal lobe. Okay, so the frontal lobe is the part of the brain that is our judgment, it's our planning, it's our, uh, basically our social skills, and I have a great example of the social skills. So when I was 13, we lived in Panama, and we used to like to, on weekends, we would take, not Panama Canal, not Panama City. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we would take these little puddle hoppers, and we'd fly over to different parts of the country and go and see different, you know, different things. So one day my mom and I were going, we were going to take this flight. So we go and we get on the plane and we're sitting there. And they're starting, it's a small plane. It's like, you know how the buses have those little shh windows? You know, yeah. school buses? Well, they had these on these planes, okay? Because it was like no AC, so we had our windows down. And we're sitting there, and they're starting to pull the thing up for us to take off. And there's a bunch of commotion. And I hear the stewardess is talking to this man. The man gets on, he's just big, overweight man, just just stunk. I mean, sweat everywhere, smoking a cigar, because you can smoke back then. Cigars in his pocket. The whole plane just started kind of reeking, and he just walks in, and he's just he's 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 bumping into people as he's going down the aisle, and he's you know looking for a seat. Well, he sees this little old lady sitting there, and she has her poodle next to her in the seat. And he says, "Move that dog. I'm sitting there." And she said, "Move that dog and scoot over. I'm sitting here." She's like, "I'm not moving that. I, I bought that seat for my dog, and he's gonna ride there. And he's gonna, oh, you're gonna move that dog." And she's like, "No, I'm not gonna move the dog. You can kindly go find somewhere else to sit." I'm 13. I'm like, oh, check this out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they're sitting there and they're kind of going back and forth. Well, he reaches down and grabs the dog. Oh, and no. And at this point, now believe it or not, at this point, we're starting to take off. So they, you know, they didn't care. This is a pandemic and have different rules than we do here. 
So we're taking up. So they're fighting over this dog. He takes the lady and pushes her down and throws the dog out the window. What? Oh. I know, right? <laughs> and that, even at 13, I'm like, oh, that's just wrong. <laughs> I, I would have heard that, man. So, so the dog goes out the window. So the, the lady gets up and she grabs him and she grabs a cigar. She throws the cigars out the window, makes him mad and everything. Well, finally, the lady that's working gets up and kind of separates him and walks him back and gets him and sat down. So the lady's sitting there and you see her and she's sitting there and she's kind of shaking because she's you know, nervous and everything. And she looks over and she sees the dog's crying and it hits her. She's like, oh my God, you know. And she looks out and the dog is on the wing of the plane. <laughs> and guess what he had in his mouth? Cigar. Cigar. The, the brick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I so, so we, we, that joke was told, and I got totally taken by it. So I use it here. But the reason I use that joke is because it's a great example of frontal lobe function. The guy had no social skills, no planning. He was late, which is a, you know a, a planning issue. He was rude. He had no social. Just you know, just that that lack of frontal lobe capacity. Okay, so you guys will never forget frontal lobe. Um, the other example of the frontal lobe is uh, kids. You know, they come and say, hey, I don't like your shirt, I don't like your clothes, or I don't like your dress. It's not that they're being rude, it's just they don't have that editing feature. Um, I just had a patient that came in and she had a frontal lobe stroke and she said she has the hardest time. So sometimes somebody will say something funny and she'll just get so irately mad and then they say something, you know, mean and she laughs at them. You know, and, and <laughs> so, so they just don't have that frontal lobe ability. Um, so as kids, we don't develop that we don't fully mature our brains until about 25 years old. And that's why teenagers are so dangerous because we have the hormones going crazy and we don't have social development. It's just, I've got two of them and it's just chaos. <laughs> um, so, so there's that aspect, but then on the back end as we get older and we start losing function, you can see kind of the same thing. You may have a grandparent or somebody who has lost their social skills or a little more harsh with people than they used to. They don't have the patience they used to. They can't plan and figure out where they're supposed to be, things like that. Okay. So that's frontal lobe, okay? Um, we have uh, parietal lobe. Now, parietal lobe it has two main functions. Uh, first one is, if I close my arm, my eyes, and I put my arm out here, I know my arm is right there without looking at it because this parietal lobe is telling me where that arm is, okay? Um, the other thing that the parietal lobe does, so, so if you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you're losing your balance because the lights are off, that's a parietal lobe issue and a cerebellar issue. Uh, and the reason for that is because you don't have your eyes, the light's not there for you to fixate and be able to maintain that balance, so you can't get your proprioception now. Um, the other thing about the parietal lobe is if I take a hammer and I drop it on my foot, that's supposed to hurt, okay? But sitting here in these chairs is not supposed to hurt. A lot of patients have chronic pain syndromes because their parietal lobe is hyperactive, because it's being triggered by something. It's not a neurological issue, it's not a downstream nerve pressure, some kind of trauma, it's just some kind of an activation of that parietal lobe. So we'll have phantom pains that, that, that have no cause. Okay, so chronic pain, loss of balance, loss of proprioception, being clumsy, those are parietal lobe type issues. All right, and then the third one is temporal lobe. Anybody ever go to Walmart and come out and can't find your car? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or can't remember what car you drove. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> no. that's um, So that's a temporal lobe issue, that short-term memory loss. Walking into a room and can't remember why you're there, um, going to say something, you can't find the words, things along those lines, that's temporal lobe. Um, there's a part of the brain inside of the temporal lobe, it's a little bit deeper to the cerebrum, called the hippocampus. It's not the hypothalamus, but it's the hippocampus. And that's the part of the brain that uh, cortisol and the different stress factors really, really love. And that's the part of the brain that starts to degenerate in, in dementia and Alzheimer's. So chronic stress is not the only cause of you know, Alzheimer's and things like that, but it's a contributing factor to that uh, exacerbation. So we want to look at those things. Now, what do you do about that? Okay, this is, this is really cool. So you have a neuron that fires to a neuron, okay? That neuron will fire to three neurons. Now this is what I'm doing, I'm just making this very simple, which will fire to three more, and so on and so forth. So it's like if you go to an Amway meeting and you find three, you get three, you get three there. So, this is, <laughs> so if this neuron stops functioning, then everything <coughs> downstream from that will not function properly, okay? So you'll lose the ability to touch your nose with your eyes closed. You'll lose sensation in your feet. You'll lose the ability to stand on one foot with your eyes closed. You'll lose all these different abilities because you can't get that happening. So what we do in functional neurology is we use uh, fuel and activation. The fuel comes in the form of uh, correcting the metabolic processes, getting good fuel from your metabolism. And then also when you're in our office, now you guys didn't see it tonight because we had the schedule kind of cleared for the workshop. 
but we use oxygen here in the office. And what happens is you put the oxygen on and it hyper oxygenates your system. And then we do very, very specific exercises to trigger these neurons to fire with each other. So for example, if there's a frontal lobe issue, we might have you doing dot touch, but we might throw math into it. So you have to think, plan, and figure out where you're going because that'll stimulate frontal lobe, parietal lobe, cerebellum, all kinds of different things. And then when these neurons start firing, then all of a sudden these guys start picking up and you start getting those functions back. It's called neuroplasticity, and we used to think that the brain could not be recovered, but we're discovering that it can be. And it happens all the time, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I love watching that happen. So that's functional neurology, and that's how we work with the brain. All right. All right. So, all right, now we're going to go to our metabolic assessment form. That's going to be the ones with all the ones, twos, and threes on it. All right, you see how those, how those are broken into categories? Okay. So category one, I'm going to go through these first four categories kind of quick. Um, category one, if you have any ones, twos, and threes circled in category one, you're going to draw a line and you're going to write the word colon. Okay. Now, issues that can come up with this part of the body or this system would be things like dysbiosis, which is where your, your bacterial content in the bowel is not balanced. Okay, It's not the way it should be. Um, it can be issues with constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, things along those lines. Okay, so that's category one. Category two, make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. Oh, I just jumped. Okay, category two and category three, if you have any ones, twos, or threes circled in there, that's going to be stomach. And this is dealing primarily with uh, stomach acid levels. What we find with most patients when they come in with thyroid issues, they have too little stomach acid, okay? And yet most patients when they come in with thyroid issues are on Prilosec or some kind of Prevacid or some kind of a proton pump inhibitor, okay? And the reason for that is when you have too little stomach acid and you eat, the food stays in your stomach for too long, it starts to ferment. And with that combination of that fermentation and the little acid that you do have, it can give you that reflux. So then you take Tums or Prevacid or whatever the, these, these uh, air acids and proton pump inhibitors are, and they reduce that acid a little further, which makes the situation worse. You feel better, but you're making the situation worse, which gets into nutrient deficiencies and all kinds of issues. So um, we've got to determine if you have too little stomach acid. If you do, we've got to get that up to normal levels. Well, okay. well it doesn't have to do with gallbladder too? Gallbladder, yeah, that's next. Oh, I yeah. don't have gallbladder. Okay, right, you need to be on bile salts. So that's a clinical pearl. Anybody who does not have a gallbladder, you have to be on bile salts. Um, because the bile salts, what that does is that causes the breakdown of the fatty foods that you eat. Um, basically, your gallbladder stores the bile, and yeah. when you eat the food and it comes out of the stomach with the proper hydrochloric acid content, it squeezes that bile in there, and the bile breaks down your fatty foods. So if you don't have a gallbladder and you're not getting that influx of bile, you're not gonna break down your fatty foods, you're not gonna break down your omega-3 fatty acid supplements, you're not gonna break down all these different things and you're gonna be having a lot of issues with that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Your mom doesn't have a gallbladder. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. And bile salts are not expensive. We've got some here, it's called Colacol. Um, that is like, I think, well, I don't know what it costs, but it's not, it's not very expensive. That's something that you're gonna have and you're gonna to wanna to take with your meal. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they wanna put me on this stuff called Questron. And it was 250 bucks when I got my gobbler taken out. Well, my insurance only picks up part of it, and they want $66 for it. Not, yeah. I'm not paying $66 for something that yeah. I know doesn't work that well. Yeah, yeah, bottle sells like maybe $12 a bottle or something. It's not, it's not expensive, so that's a, that's a much better option. Uh, okay, so that's category two and three. Category four is gonna be small intestines. So if you have any ones, twos, or threes in category four, you're gonna write small intestines. Okay, so the main thing that happens in the small intestines is nutrient assimilation. Do you all know what that means? No. Okay, so basically you have a bunch of cells that are bumped up against each other like this. And then this is a horrible drawing, but this is your gastrointestinal tract. So the food comes down and it breaks down into small proteins and when it gets small enough, it goes out through these little tight junctions and gets into the blood and that's how your body assimilates its nutrients. If you're eating things or you have gastric inflammation due to all sorts of different causes, if you have this chronically, these tight junctions will actually open up and get bigger. And then you'll have these bigger proteins that'll come in and they'll get in the blood supply. So if you get these big proteins in the blood supply, they're not supposed to be there. So the body says, oh, these are, uh, these are invaders, we've got to beat it. So it makes these antibodies to come and attack it. 
so they have antibodies attacking that protein. That's fine if that happens once. But let's say it's you're so sensitive to gluten and you eat, you know, you have toast for breakfast because it's a healthy bit and you get into the day and you have a meat sandwich for that's what we call it for kids. We have a sandwich for lunch. Meat sandwich. Yeah, meat sandwich. Um, you have a sandwich for lunch and you go home and you have a grilled chicken salad with some garlic bread for dinner, but you get these doses of car of gluten throughout the day. So it's constantly happening. Well then the body will switch and it'll make an antibody army against that gluten. That antibody, especially for gluten, likes to morph and start attacking other tissues in the body, specifically the thyroid gland. So Hashimoto's is a huge case almost every single time that leaky gut syndrome is one of the causes of it. Almost actually times leaky gut. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you knew that word was coming, didn't yep. you? <laughs> so leaky gut syndrome is small intestine uh, primarily. So if you have ones, twos, or threes in there, tell us we primarily have gastric inflammation, but there's a strong chance of leaky gut syndrome as well. Okay. Now, the reason I went through these kind of quick is if you group all of these together, that forms the gut. Okay? Remember, T3, T4, T4 has to be converted. It goes over here, it hits the gut. If it's not functioning properly and you're not getting that conversion, you're not going to have levels of T3 that you should have. So if you have a gut based issue, you can take synthroid, leave all that stuff all day long, but you're not going to get that conversion. So you have another conversion issue. Okay? Um, the other thing about the gut is about 70% of our immune system happens there because of the bacterial content, um, and about 90% of our serotonin, which is our feel good neurotransmitters, produced there. So if you have a gut based issue, it leads to depression and so on. And then we need to have rheumatoid arthritis too. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, rheumatoid, that's another factor with those, those antibodies. So. All right, so category number five is liver and gallbladder, which you already know you since you have your liver are your grains, you have gallbladder. Um, my, my gallbladder is, 40% of it is gone. Is it? Okay. My um, liver, I mean my liver. Your liver, okay. Yeah. Um, so liver is our detoxification center of the body. It detoxifies our blood. Um, it uh, is also important in blood sugar metabolism. Uh, it's got some stores in it called glucagon. So if our blood sugar drops too low, the liver will kick this out into the blood supply to keep our levels back normal. But if your liver's not functioning right, that can lead to hypoglycemia. That's part of the reason for that. Um, the other important factor on the liver, besides fat metabolism, sugar metabolism, detoxification, is it sits right here in the conversion factor. And between the let and, uh, the let and giver, between the gut and the liver, that is 80% of our conversion of T4 to T3. So if you have a gut-based issue and a liver-based issue, you can be normal here all day long, but you're gonna have thyroid issues. Uh, no, I'm sorry. You're gonna have issues that appear to be thyroid-related, okay? Um, about 70% of the patients that we see that are hypothyroid do not have a thyroid problem. They have some kind of an under-conversion issue or they have Hashimoto's, which is an immune system issue, something along those lines. When you clear those up, the thyroid works just fine. It's just all these things around it that are not working right. So really, if like your diet's messed up, mm -hmm. it would, if, if your diet's messed up, or we're getting into blood sugar and adrenals and all these different aspects of it. So okay. there's there's a lot of different factors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So category six and seven. If you have ones, twos, or threes in either one of those, that's going to be sugar. All right. Category six is hypoglycemia or too low blood sugar. Category seven is hyperglycemia or too high blood sugar. Now, how many of you have it in both of them? I am mostly in. Mostly in hypo? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have it in both, you're what we call an insulin reactor. And what that means is basically when you eat a food that converts into a carbohydrate, your blood sugar goes too high and the body chases it trying to get it down and then pulls it down too low. So, and that's got to get you know, stabilized. If you, so your blood sugar has a normal range that we want to see functionally between 85 and 100. Um, if you're skipping that range either too high or too low, there is no way that your body's going to heal because that's chronic inflammation. If blood sugar is too high or too low, um, too high influences uh, immune function. Blood sugar affects thyroid binding globulin. Blood sugar affects how your, your hormones function. Blood sugar affects almost every system in the body. And it also causes the blood brain barrier to open up, which lets inflammatory chemicals get into affect the brain. And then, of course, the brain is what controls everything. So now you have bad brain functioning, sending out bad signals. So it starts this bad cycle. So blood sugar has got to be normalized. Okay. So oh, that, that that explains my my crashes I have every day. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I love the Snickers commercials. <laughs> yeah. those, are, those, are, those are great. <laughs> um, all right. So categories eight and nine. That's going to be the adrenal glands. 
Yeah, that's those adrenals, no matter what you think it's those. <laughs> <laughs> so, category of, so the adrenal glands. Basically, what happens is your pituitary gland sends a signal to the adrenal glands and tells the adrenal glands what to do. Okay, so the adrenal glands are our uh, flight or flight glands, okay? You're walking in the woods, you see a bear, the bear attacks, charges you, you either fight that bear or you run. Have y'all ever seen the movie Revenant? Mm -hmm. Is that a great bear yeah, scene? That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. Really <laughs> so bear attack scene there is just phenomenal. Um, if you have a weak stomach, don't watch it. Um, so, so the adrenal glands is that fight or flight response. You either fight it or you run. But there's a physical response that burns off the cortisol, the epinephrine, the norepinephrine, all these hormones that are created to, to cause that response. And what happens is when the adrenal glands kick in, it takes the, the blood away from the internal organs and it puts them towards the muscles and your pupils dilate, your hair stands up, and you, you just get that defense mechanism. So that's an important factor. The blood goes away from the digestive tract, okay? Keep that in mind. Because if you're driving down the road trying to get to a workshop at, say, 545 and you're running a few minutes late mm -hmm. and you're stressed in about the car is pulling for you, that's a fight or flight response. If you're stressed off, stressed, stressed off, stressed about work, <laughs> um, if you're stressed about your kids, if you're stressed about home life, any kind of stress, is the same fight or flight response in the body. So what happens is when the adrenal glands are chronically stressed, then they start to get that increased activity. So your cortisol levels will start to increase and you'll start having symptoms that go into category nine. That's your elevated adrenal function. Yeah. If it goes on for too long, then the adrenal glands will start to wear out. Okay, they're still putting out 100% effort. It's kind of like if you take a dumbbell and you start curling it, you know, you're good for the first five or six, but even though you're putting out 100% effort, you start fatiguing, you mm -hmm. can't quite do it anymore. Or that's what the adrenal glands are doing. So then your cortisol levels will start dropping. And when that happens, you get into category number eight. So if you have ones, twos, and threes circled in category number eight, that tells me that you're not just chronically stressed, you're chronically distressed to the point that you're wearing out your adrenal glands, okay? Now, the reason I said that about the digestive tract with that, that blood going away from the digestive tract, if you're chronically stressed and the body is pulling away from what they call the feed and breed system, which is the other system of the body, if it's pulling away from that, then you're gonna start getting into digestive issues. You're gonna start getting into gut-based issues because the, the, the body doesn't have the resources to do that because you're chronically stressed. That's why they tell you not to eat when you're stressed, okay? Um, on the other hand, that's why chewing gum can actually help reduce stress because it kicks in that digestive tract a little bit. It's what we call the, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. So just little tricks that you can do. Okay, so that's the adrenals. The other thing that's important about the adrenal glands is your liver, see why I couldn't put the PowerPoint up here? I'm just kind of take over the board. Mm -hmm. um, the liver produces cholesterol. And everybody thinks the cholesterol of the devil is not. The cholesterol is absolutely necessary in the body. I have patients that are in the 120s when they come in because of cholesterol medications, which is about to kill them. All they have to do is reduce their cholesterol meds and they do a lot better. Um, so cholesterol, which converts into pregnenolone, is what that says. Now pregnenolone is what we call a rate-limiting step in the body, meaning the body only makes so much pregnenolone. Okay? That way it can control how much is out there as far as, far as hormones are concerned. Pregnenolone converts into progesterone, which then converts to cortisol, DHEA, estrogen, and testosterone. So this pregnenolone in an ideal situation would break up into cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone, and we have a balanced hormonal system. If we have adrenal fatigue and this cortisol is getting low, then the body starts siphoning those resources. When it siphons those resources, your progesterone goes out of balance, your testosterone and your estrogen goes out of balance. And you start having hormonal-based issues, okay? Usually, probably 80% of the time, the fix for hormonal issues is fixing the adrenal glands. I had a patient that came in and she was with us. Um, she had uh, severe blood sugar and severe adrenal issues. And so we worked with her for about six months. Phenomenally well, she did great. She emailed me, this is going on, I'm gonna say about 15 months ago, she emailed me. She's like, Dr. Price, Dr. Price, guess what, I'm pregnant. I'm like, cool, that's awesome. This was one of those good times that they got pregnant. <laughs> so I'm like, cool, that's awesome, it's great to hear. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. She goes, I went through two years of fertility treatments, we did this, we spent $50,000 on this, we did all these different things, I could not get pregnant. 
She said, I ain't giving up. And I'm like, well, you never mentioned that to me. She was, I didn't think I could do it. She said, I didn't think there was anything there. All we did was address her adrenal plans. And she was pregnant within a couple months of being done with care. The other cool thing was, she emailed me about a month later, and she was like, guess what, they're twins. So it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I was really glad she was happy about it. <laughs> um, and they're beautiful babies. They are, they're just adorable. She, she actually brought her son in for it to us for some other stuff. But um, yeah, they're doing, doing really, really well. So you fix the adrenal glands, a lot of times the system will, back, or will be well. So with that being said, if anybody does come in here and start treatment with us, and you are possibly anywhere near childbearing years, you have to be careful because your body will regress and get back into that and you can't become fertile. So just be very careful, okay? All right, so that's the adrenal glands. That's my disclaimer, I had to throw it out there. <laughs> um, categories 10 and 11 are the thyroid gland. Uh, category 11 is hyperthyroid. Category 10 is hypothyroid. All right, so we've already talked about the thyroid gland, but if you have anything in those categories, you're gonna write thyroid. Now, does anybody have anything in category, um, category 10? I'm sorry, category 11, the hyperthyroid? Do y'all have some of that in there? Okay, um, the reason that could be is because when your blood sugar, when your blood sugar goes up, your cortisol function goes up, or at least the demand on the adrenal glands goes up with it, and thyroid function goes down. So when cortisol and blood sugar go down, then thyroid function goes up. So there's this back and forth waxing and waning. So that can be why if you're truly hypothyroid, where you can have symptoms of hyperthyroid at times. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah you can have those fluctuations. And also with Hashim Hashimoto's, um, if the thyroid peroxide and antibodies attack the thyroid gland and they get what's called a thyroid pump, that'll give you a hyperthyroid symptoms as well. Bigeminy doesn't help either, right? What's that? Bigeminy. What's that, Jeremy? I have, my heart stops once in a while. Oh, okay, okay, so you're on medication. I'm sorry. No, I'm not on medicine for it. No, I can't take a beta blocker or anything like that. Okay, okay. And so I'm by Jimmy, is that condition with, with the heart? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, any kind of fluctuation like that. And, you know, things like blood sugar and adrenal function, they don't help uh, heart malfunctions either. Right. So I'm going to have to look that one up, my Jimmy. It's, uh, it's, it's not fun. Yeah. It hurts sometimes. So, so I have a saying with you guys. If you guys bring anything up that I don't know, it's very, very possible. There's, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. So it's kind of one of those constant learning things. Uh, but if you bring something up to me, I, that's the last time I'm not going to know about it because I will go and I will look at it. So it, don't hesitate to bring things up and, and I will look for it. Um, okay, so that's that. Now, uh, category 12 and 13, that's the pituitary gland. So if you guys have any ones, twos, or threes in there, that's going to be your pituitary gland, which is what we call the master control gland of the endocrine system. It controls the thyroid, the adrenals, the, the male and female organs. Um, so issues in there can cause uh, challenges as well. And that's not one of the main areas that we look, but if we have a situation that's kind of sticking, then we'll look at that and see what we have to do with it. All right, categories 14 and 15. If you are a female and you filled out category 14 and 15, you have a brain-based issue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the males, and category 16 and 17 is the female hormones, and we've already talked about the hormones, but if you have any issues in there, then you're going to write hormone. All right, so this is what we call the web of physiological dysfunction. All right, this is why if you're taking Synthroid or Levo or whatever, and it's not helping, that's why you still feel so badly because you have so many other factors that there's not one pill to fix. Now the other the thing that's really important is if you have all these things going on, you can't go and just address all this. Okay, you can't go and just do a liver flush and go do a gut cleanse and then go do a, lip, uh, a, a, a blood sugar clean or you know, just all these different cleanses and everything. Because if you do, it's like, it's like if you have this big fire and you're aiming the water hose at the top of the flames. It's like you're just chasing stuff, you're not fixing anything. If you figure out what the core is and you get aim the fire, the, the hose at the base of the fire, and then all the stuff, the other stuff clears out because you put the fire out of the base. So for most people, when you get in here and start looking at this stuff, if you have a severe adrenal-based issue, that's number one. You gotta fix that because the adrenal glands will not allow you to heal if you have that going on. Blood sugar has to be balanced. Um, if you have anemias, there's not just iron deficiency, there's also B12 anemia, there's a bunch of different B vitamin anemias, all kinds of different anemias. If you have autoimmune conditions, if you have, there are things that we call heel breakers that are the foundation, and if you have those things, you can do all this other stuff all day long and you won't heal. 
So you gotta figure out where they are, what their priorities are, and we go and address them in, in order. And when you do that, all this other stuff starts to clear up. Just like with her with the adrenals. We never address fertility with her. I never address hormones. And, uh, and, and we balance her out and she, her body deal with them. So it's really, really cool to watch. So how do we discover what's going on? How do we find out what your priorities are and what your issue is? Um, testing is the main thing that you have to do, okay? Uh, for example, blood work. Uh, we do a, uh, a blood panel that consists of CBC with differential. Um, so we're looking for anemias, immune challenges, parasitic allergies, things like that with, with that part of it. Uh, we do what's called a complete metabolic panel. We're checking liver function, adrenal function, uh, kidney function, um, sugar metabolism. Uh, we do a lipid panel because we want to see what your cholesterol levels are, not because cholesterol has to be lowered, but because it tells me how you're handling sugar and it tells me how your body's doing autoimmune wise. Um, we want to break down your cholesterol levels so we can see what your triglycerides are, your LDLs and all that. Um, again, for different reasons outside of putting you on cholesterol meds, which we don't do medications, but that's, that's, that's another story. Um, we do a thyroid panel. Our thyroid panel is not just TSH. It's TSH, it's T3, it's T4, it's reverse T3, free T3, free T4, free thyroxine index, it's thyroid peroxidase antibodies, it's thyroid binding blocker antibodies. We're checking all of these different things to figure out if there's a breakdown where it's happening, okay? Um, we look at B12, we look at folate, we run an iron panel. Not just iron levels, we need to know if it's getting into the cells, what the iron binding capacity is. There's a lot of different things that you look at and you analyze it all using functional lab values. And that's where you find out where the malfunctions are happening. So that's our main test that we run with people. Uh, we do adrenal and salivary hormone testing. I don't do that test a whole lot, but when I need to, we run that test for people. Uh, we can actually do a leaky gut syndrome test. I used to run it on every single patient that walked in the door. And guess how many people were positive? 100%. So I don't run it all the time anymore unless you want to see it. Um, the good thing about that test is we can run it at the end of treatment and make sure you're clear. So that's what we use that for primarily. Um, with that blood panel that I said, we run that in the beginning, we start treatment, and we run it again to see how we're doing as far as treatment is concerned. Uh, food sensitivity testing, that is huge. If you have any kind of a gut-based issue, we definitely want to run our food sensitivity testing. And it's not, they're, they're, so there's IgE antibodies, which are uh, you eat a peanut, you're allergic to it, you swell up and you die. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you know you're allergic to that food. Um, so we don't test for those. We test for IgG and IgA antibodies. So let's say you have a sensitivity to corn. You eat corn one day. Go through your next day, you're fine. Go through your next day, you get an itch. You're like, gosh, what is this itch? I'm kind of bloated and everything. Well, you had milk for breakfast that morning, so you're thinking, oh, it must be the dairy. I got to stay away from that. You don't relate it to the corn that you had three or four days ago. And there are, that make you itch a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, there are, are responses in the body that can take up to four to six days for your body to actually have the autoimmune response. So we test for those. Um, Everybody is on the gluten kick right now. Everybody thinks the gluten is the devil. And it is for a lot of people. Uh, we don't even test for gluten. We test for foods that are cross-reactive to gluten because I'll give you an example. I've got a, a nephew who has celiac disease. Okay, you all know what that is? It's, it's a severe gluten intolerance. It's like a, it's a severe, oh, yeah. yeah. He came and spent the week with us last summer. I'm like, this is great. You know, we all eat gluten free. This is gonna be no problem. He's gonna be a cakewalk to feed. His mom brought him a suitcase of full, full of food. She sits it down. It's gluten-free chips, gluten-free cookies, gluten-free brownies, gluten-free this, gluten-free pancakes, gluten-free cheese, gluten. The kid has skin rashes. He has all these different issues. Oh. Totally gluten-free, but he eats. He's, he's a vegetarian. He doesn't eat. Doesn't like vegetables. Doesn't eat this. Doesn't eat it. The kid's just poisoning himself. And and so I'm I'm working really hard with them to try to kind of break through their paradigm. Mm -hmm. But. So, so that testing that we test, it tests these cross-reactive foods, because like, for example, buckwheat, felt, uh, soy, all these things are in these health foods, but if you're sensitive to them, they're still causing the same response in the body. So we test for those. Um, those are the primary tests that we run. Uh, we do some hair sampling if we need to. We can do stool sampling. We have uh, the whole spectrum of tests that we do. I try to get it through without doing too much testing, but we have to figure out what's going on. And, and that's the goal of what we're doing. So that makes sense. Okay, so the, uh, once we've done that, then we can figure out what the individual cause is for each individual person. And so that's the approach that we take to treatment, right? So that's why 
you can't assign labels to things. That's, you know, you can't assign just hypothyroidism and say, this is what you do. This, I, I don't have a cookie or a plan for everybody that walks in with that situation because everybody is different. Um, and, and that's also why that elevator, you know, doesn't exist because you just got to take it slow by slow or step by step. And you have to do it in order. You can't fix the gut unless you fix the adrenals. So you can't do it out of order because it's not going to work. Okay. All right. So I just got to hit on myself. All right. If your page looks like this, you might want to consider coming in and see us. Okay. The way that we do this, we use a two visit process for our new patients. Um, the first visit you come in and I, we give you an extensive uh, history package. I have you guys write your history and I do that for two reasons. Number one, if you write it, then it's going to trigger memories and you'll go back in and you'll add more in. I get people with typed out dissertations and, and I love it. I love getting a history like that because it shows me where you've been and what you've done. Um, so you're going to give me a detailed history. You're going to bring these questionnaires along with other questionnaires that we're going to give you and that's going to help me figure out what's going on with you. Okay. On that first visit when you come in, we do a complete neurological evaluation to figure out what, what's going on with the brain. There are about six of us in here, probably three of you can't feel your feet right now. You think you can, you don't know that you can't, but when I do the testing on you, you're gonna have decreased uh, sensation in your feet. Won't be able to touch your nose with your pinky. Won't be able to tell me how many fingers I'm touching you with. You'll have all these decreased functions that you don't know that you have. So we go through and we do a complete neurological evaluation. Um, after that first visit, we part ways. I go through, I read your history, and I write your questionnaires, compare it with the neurological evaluation. We get together on a second visit. On the second visit, I let you know, number one, I tell you everything I found, and you're gonna learn more in that visit than you've ever learned about your body. You think this isn't interesting, wait till you see it when it's on a personal level. Um, we're gonna go through all that. We're gonna go through, um, if I think I can help you, what kind of a treatment plan we're looking at, okay? Like what I'm thinking time-wise and treatment-wise. Uh, we go over costs on the second visit. Uh, we go over all these things and kind of iron out what we're going to do to move forward at that point on that second visit. So it's a two-visit process. Typically, the services that we offer in that two visits would run about $250. Um, what we do with patients that come in and do the workshop with us is we offer both visits for $65. Okay, so it's $65 total for both visits. And the reason I do that is because there are six of y'all in here just save you five hours of talking in the office because <laughs> you guys all understand what we're doing. So, um, so $65 for those two visits. Uh, like I said, if your, your sheet looks like this, it would be the best $65 you ever spent. Whether you get treatment with this or not, you'll at least understand what's going on with you and where to go from there. Okay. So to, uh, let me see, I don't want to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, so a couple things we have to keep in mind. Um, number one, if your condition is something that's important to you and it's affecting you, then consider coming in. If it's not, if it's like a, you know, if I asked you on a scale of one to 10, how how severe you consider this, and you said like a five, I wouldn't come in. You know, it's not gonna be worth the time or what you want to, what you have to put into it. Um, so don't do that. But if it's like an eight or nine, I highly recommend you come in for it. Um, you have to make, willing to make lifestyle changes, all right? I love to eat. I'm not gonna have you guys eating nuts and seeds, <laughs> okay? I am an eater, I love to eat, but we gotta do what we gotta do. So we're gonna make the changes we have to make, but we're gonna get you back to a normal diet and handle what we can handle as quick as we can. Um, I had a patient come in, I was sitting down with her for her, what we call her report of findings that second visit. And she goes, okay, great, I'm really excited, tell me all about it, but I gotta tell you first, I don't wanna change how I eat, I hate exercise, I'm not gonna do it, I can't swallow pills, I'm not gonna take supplements, I'm not changing my diet. So what are we doing? I'm like, okay, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you know, I went through and gave her findings, but there was nothing I could do for her. She wasn't going to make any changes. Um, you gotta take accountability for yourself. Uh, we talked about, you know, your congruent actions. So as soon as you realize that, hey, you know, I've got control of this, and if you can control those actions and you control the outcome, then you set yourself on a whole new path. So you gotta take that responsibility. I like to, you say, it's not Trump's fault, it's not Obama's fault, it's not oh, Donald's fault, it's not your mom's fault, it's, you know, it's, you gotta take your responsibility um, for yourself. Um, and the question that everybody asks is, does my insurance cover? I don't know. Done, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, we work with most insurances, okay? Uh, I can't answer that question until we've done that first visit because I don't know what testing you're gonna need, I don't know what kind of treatment you're gonna need, I don't know what's gonna be involved in your care. Um, up front, you're gonna wanna ask Anna, does my insurance cover this? She doesn't know, she can't answer that question. And I hate to be vague about it, but that's just where we are. Um, I can give you guys a ballpark. I've had patients that have completed care with me for as low as three to $500. And that's over a six month process. 
I've had patients that have completed care with me for as high as eight to nine thousand dollars. I hate to give you that ball bounce, just that's just where we are right now. The purpose of the first two visits is to figure out what's going on with you, and on that second visit, I'll tell you exactly what your insurance is going to cover, exactly what your out of pocket is going to be. It will get it down to the penny. You'll know what your responsibility is on that second visit, and that's just that's the best I can do at this point. So. Um, if you want to set up an appointment, when you go up front, there are going to be some cards that are going to be fluorescent colored, and they'll have our new patient appointment times. Just grab the card that works for you, get your little half slip of paper, put that with the card, and I'll take it from you. She'll collect the $65, and then she'll get to the next person. So if all you guys sign up, we'll be out of here in like seven minutes, because you just grab the card and go. All right? All right, let me see if I have forgotten anything. That. One of the things is um, you're going to get a binder when you go, um, the binder's going to have all the questionnaires in it. It's also going to have instructions for the first visit. So you need to come in with shorts and a t-shirt. Um, you need to have your, your paperwork filled out. It doesn't have to be shorts, but it's got, got to be able to get to the lower part of your legs uh, to do the neurological evaluation. Um, you need to have all your paperwork filled out, so on and so forth. That'll be in the, in the binder. So, all right. Okay, any questions? I've got like three minutes. We're doing great. <laughs> so like the first two visits, you don't do any testing yet, though. We, well, so on that first visit, when I get those questionnaires, mm -hmm. if you have labs, I'm glad you said it. If you have labs that have been done in the last 90 days, bring them in, and I'll analyze them using these functional lab values. Um, when I get those questionnaires back, that's going to give me ideas of what I need to do as far as testing. So on the second visit, I'll go over the testing with you as far as what I need to do. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. So there's like some symptoms that you're talking about that I have extremely like severe of, and then others not so much. Okay. Like okay. really at all, mm -hmm. and then so I mean, what do you advise like? I mean, like, I'm extremely tired all the time. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely no energy. How old are you? I'm 20. Okay. And it, it, it only goes down from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah. Like, I do think it's definitely, like, yeah. thyroid-related. Like, my whole family has it. Yeah. And I've, I've been, like, tested by blood, and, um, and nothing was right. found. But I also have looked it up, and they said that it's very common for it to be kind of passed by, especially at my age. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but you know, there's some things that are like very Severe. intense, and yeah. then sometimes like the other things that you're talking about that not. Really at your fun. age, uh, just just point blank, at your age, I would say you gotta make that appointment because I would, even if you only have, let's say, a sugar handling issue, then and that's why you're fatigued. Maybe it has nothing to do with your thyroid gland. And like, yeah, like fatigue, weight gain, and like, like yeah. you know, things like very just things like that. Yeah. Um, you, because of your age, you're in a really, really good place because you've got youth on your side, you've got you know lack of tissue destruction on your side. The only thing that can limit the body's ability to heal is what we call limitation of matter. And basically, let's say you have Hashimoto's and the thyroid's been being attacked for 20 years, well, you're gonna have dead thyroid tissue. So the amount of recovery that can happen is gonna be based on how much viable thyroid tissue we have left. So somebody who comes in at 70 and has been dealing with it for that long is gonna have much less recovery than somebody who's 20 and we get right at the beginning. So I would say definitely make the appointment. Um, you know, I can't go into any more detail until I know what's going on with you, but you know, it's, it's it definitely just look at the case and see what's going on. You might be a simple case of adjust you and throw you a couple of supplements and you're done, but you may not. So we're just going to have to figure that out. So, yeah. Any other questions? I got a friend <laughs> I, 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 I got one too. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Okay, all right, very good. Well, I'll see you guys in the office. I hope this was helpful. Again, if you have any questions, please email me. I'd love to answer them. Um, and just let me know if there's anything else we can do for you. Okay, Thank you. you're welcome. Thank you.